Good afternoon, nice everyone. It's uh, a little after one. This is uh, February 3rd, and Senate Education is uh, starting its afternoon of work. We're starting out today uh, with uh, Secretary French. Mr. Secretary, it's great to have you with us, as usual. Uh, Secretary French is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the governor's proposal for uh, his, the governor's child care proposal. Uh, uh, everyone likely heard that in the budget address, and he's going to take us through that. I've then asked him to talk a little bit about uh, this church and state issues related to uh, what we're seeing right now uh, in our religious schools and vouchers. And uh, uh, I'm not articulating it as well as he will, but the short of it is uh, what, what rules has the agency uh, adopted um, and We'll then hear from Professor Teachout, who'll talk a little bit more about some of those church and state issues that we've been reading about and learning about from our constituents. And then later in the afternoon, we will jump into our three bills that we have been spending the most time on, that being S-16, uh, some more on literacy and the proposals from VSAC. I just met with the pro tem for a little while uh, to go over some of our work um, and to also inform her as uh, I'll also inform all of you, we will on Tuesday be hearing from Jeff Fannin and his group of people. Uh, and I need to talk to you about this also, Mr. Secretary, about what they are envisioning uh, for um, students that might have deficits uh, in post-COVID uh, Vermont. So. That's just a over, little overview uh, of where we're at. Uh, I now will turn it over to Mr. Secretary. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, as the chair mentioned, um, I'll start off speaking a bit about um, our child care proposal, which is uh, usually entitled uh, Restructure of CDD. Um, and I shared a PowerPoint, Jeannie, I don't know if you have that or not, um, but we can kind of use that. We, we prepared this PowerPoint for joint testimony uh, between my, uh, you know, our folks at AOE and my esteemed colleagues at AHS who are not with me today. So um, I will do my best to, to cover that. Um, and Secretary then I'll also, Brent, yes. Secretary, I have made you co-host so you can share whatever documents oh. you'd like. Okay, very good. Thank you. The... Um, and I'll make some comments about um, the sort of church and state issues, uh, which is the subject of active litigation. Uh, very interested in hearing Professor Teachout's observation on that. Um, but I am uh, essentially a named litigant in some of that work. So um, yeah. I'm gonna be somewhat, confine my comments to some general observations. But I did also share um, a document with the committee uh, that describes uh, some, I would say, guidance or recommendations to best practice that we uh, put out to school districts. Um, so I, I'll basically use that as the basis of my comments. Um, so if that sounds good, I'll go ahead and uh, share out my screen here, uh, PowerPoint. Can you see that okay? I uh, know it's small. Okay. <laughs> I apologize one moment. Getting bigger? Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, so our, our proposal at, at this point is, um, is, is really just a proposal. We haven't reduced this to specific uh, statutory language. Um, we acknowledge uh, at the front that this is a very complex topic and um, one of which uh, will invite, and by necessity, invite a lot of stakeholder feedback and also um, feedback from legislators. So we intentionally uh, put forward this and the idea that, you know, here from an administrative side, here's something we're, uh, we're proposing from uh, basically the theme of what would be, uh, from our perspective, good government. Um, but really uh, willing and anxious to work with legislative partners and other stakeholders to, to bring this to a specific, some specificity. And I think in fairness to this, they're, they're, the devil is in some of the details, so to speak. So there is some work to do in that regard. But I'll, um, as I mentioned, th these are slides that we were jointly prepared for uh, a presentation with my colleagues at AHS. 
Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the agency of education side of that, but this will this will give you a sense of what what's involved. I think. Um, so uh, the Child De Development Division inside the Agency of Human Services has several functions, uh, one of which is child care and learning. Uh, so what we're proposing to do is to move uh, the, ch the early care and learning aspects of the CDD division to the Agency of Education. Our policy in pre-K in particular, uh, which is Act 166, has resulted in a sort of a bifurcation of administration. So the Agency of Education administers pre-K in the public school system, and the Agency of Human Services through the CDD division or through CDD um, oversees uh, pre-K in uh, the private providers, the, the care providers who take it on pre-K as well. And that, that has never uh, been well received, particularly by the public school system uh, who find themselves regulated by two agencies having to do uh, two sets of fingerprints for staff, having to go through two basically inspections of those facilities and so forth. Um, I would say since in my tenure as secretary, which is coming up on my third year, um, this has been challenging uh, to administer uh, internally. There have been times when uh, we we have a, a regulation, if you will, that has led to disputes between the two agencies and uh, myself, Secretary Gobey, or Secretary Smith have had to get together to try to figure out how to do this. So it, it's been challenging. Um, also in our data systems, uh, you might have heard of this thing called the State Longitudinal Data System, what we call the SLDS, which is a data warehouse project sponsored by the federal government. The Agency of Education uh, is essentially the sponsor of that project. We, we built onto that to include early ed data. And it's been challenging to, to create a single data model in early ed. And I think the data is a key piece um, of the policy approach in this area. So at any rate, there's, there's some things we've noticed inside of state government uh, we think that could be improved um, by bringing uh, the, the child care function under the same organizational roof, if you will, as pre-K, and to do that inside the agency of education. Uh, this would not, this does not mean the public school system taking over early learning and care. It basically um, brings these teams together under one organizational structure. Um, I'll say, you know, child development division, the term division, I think varies somewhat among different agencies. The agency of education is obviously a, a much smaller organization, the agency of human services. Uh, we're about 160 employees. Human services is about 3,500, something like that. And, uh, our divisional structure inside the agency, we don't have departments, we just have divisions. Our divisions are about 20 to 30 people. So this change would basically necessitate us creating a new division at the Agency of Education, which for, uh, for just for discussion purposes, I'll label a division of early learning and care. So we would have approximately 30 to 35 people in a new division under new leadership, um, which I think is key to sort of bring this together as a single team of integrated service from birth to uh, five-year-olds to kindergarten, essentially, uh, which I think is, is rather intriguing from our standpoint. Just check there are, are, yeah, go ahead. So uh, those 30 to 35 people, they are already, where are they now? Are those, we're not talking, just for clarification, we're not talking new staff, this is a, a That's correct. These are largely bringing over approximately 29 CDD staff to the Agency of Education. Thank you. So there's no, um, there's nothing happening in terms of uh, like the agency of education having to learn how to do this space. We're bringing over that expertise from another agency. The idea here is to, um, I'm just making the point, this would necessitate the creation of a new division, not so much integrating these employees from CDD into an existing agency education because our pre-K team is pretty small right now and it's embedded inside of what we call the student supports division, which also includes special education and a few other critical functions. So for us, it's a, it's a great way to put emphasis on this critical policy area by now having enough staff and uh, focus to necessitate the formation of, the, of a division. And the division leaders inside the agency, agency of education are essentially uh, members of my immediate leadership cabinet. So it elevates this function also to a very high level inside in a prioritization inside the agency of education. The point I'd make also from this slide is there are elements of CDD uh, that do not come over to the Agency of Education on this proposal. So this is the piece that the Agency of Human Services, if we were doing this as joint testimony, would speak more directly to. 
but there's on this slide, for example, the financial assistance, assistance program um, would be uh, as a benefit program housed at the Department of Children and Families. So there's some pieces of CDD, basically CDD would be dissolved and parts of it would be broken up into different places inside the Agency of Human Services, but this, this core function of childcare would be brought over to the Agency of Education. The, you know, the theory of action here is to have an integrated approach uh, and a more integrated approach. Um, you know, sort of, the, the, as you've heard, the governor's vision, cradle to career. But we also know of all the all the research we have out there in, this, in the education space, um, there's pretty compelling evidence to suggest that uh, the best investment we can make in the education area is on pre-K and particularly early learning and care. If we look at very successful education systems in the world, like Finland, uh, their education system is built on a foundation of really uh, birth, birth to five, uh, making all the investment they make in prenatal care and so forth. So that's that's part of seen as an integrated investment of social services, of which education is sort of the receiving end of it, if you will. Uh, but we think there's, a, if we get very intentional about this, and not to, to harp on the Finnish experience, I had the, the pleasure of going on an education tour of Finland several years ago. Um, but Finland's history is kind of interesting. You know, they came, uh, basically started to exist, exist as a nation state after World War II for the very first time in their history. And they, you know, their story when they talk about their education system is, you know, basically at that moment in time, they looked around and said, you know, we don't have a lot of natural resources. We have forests. Um, our biggest resource are our people. We need to invest very strategically in building the best education system in the world. And that's a, basically what they did very intentionally through like 20 to 30 year period. I would argue Vermont's in a similar place. Um, arguably, you know, we have wonderful natural resources, but in the era of declining, you know, our demographic challenges that we face, we cannot afford to have any student not get off to a good start. Every, any, any individual, any Vermonter not get off to a good start. We need every Vermonter to be able to be successful. So this, I think I feel that sort of prioritization uh, that maybe Finland felt as well. So that's, that's sort of the theory of action to do that administratively in state government. Um, there are, you know, once again, from an administrative standpoint, some, uh, I don't say efficiencies, but also some improvements that are going to be gained. I talked about the uh, sort of bifurcation of the administration of Act 166, the pre-K. This would now be brought under one roof. We'd be able to eliminate some of that uh, dual regulatory oversight that's been problematic. We have federal funding streams uh, that uh, idea is the Individual Disabilities Education Act, basically special ed law. There's some revenues that come down through that program, part B, part C. Uh, they're arguably focused on the same issue to help kids get off to a good start, but currently AHS administers part B, AOE administers part C, and the handoff between those two things isn't as smooth as it could have been uh, if it was administered by one agency. Um, this piece on the integrated benefits is uh, the efficiency to be gained at the uh, DCF side on the AHS side um, by basically now looking at a composite level, the benefits that are administered to families. Uh, currently CDD administers a separate benefit program uh, that families might be receiving later on through another benefit program in DCF. Uh, so this gives DCF view into a, a, a more seamless look at benefits. I mentioned the data system piece. Um, I, I'm, I'm, some of these components are more AHS oriented. So if you want to dig more deeply into those, I'd, I'd recommend bringing AHS in. But the theory is that we, we there's some things to be gained administratively. This is disruptive, certainly. Uh, but by putting pieces together and under one administrative and leadership team, there's some advantages. I will also say by introduction, um, you know, I, I don't have firm data on how these services are staffed nationally but it's not uncommon to see them housed uh, as they are now among two different agencies, but it's also equally common to see them brought together under one agency. So it's kind of, I wouldn't say 50-50, but there's a bit of both going on nationally. Um, and I mentioned, you know, I can get into specifics of how the services break down, but generally speaking, childcare would be coming over to the Agency of Education. Uh, there's mental health components of CDD that would go to the Department of Mental Health. Um, aspects, as I mentioned, benefit administration and so forth, that would go to the DCF. I'm going to skip through some of the AHS aspects, uh, but they, they would make a, a compelling argument for why um, early childhood mental health should be integrated into the broader understanding of mental health, not be separate in a separate uh, division inside the Agency of Human Services. 
Similarly, uh, DCF would make an argument as to why benefit administration would be better done under one organizational entity in AHS as opposed to having multiple entities doing that. And I guess I'll just end on this slide. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, um, what we're proposing is not to move all of CDD to AOE, but a good part of it, particularly that function around childcare licensing, referral, Head Start, gets into the pre-K administration, which is 166, or early learning and care and so forth, as I mentioned. Um, so, you know, this more or less concludes, concludes sort of my overview of what we're proposing. Once again, the devil's in the details on this. We intentionally knew going into the, the legislative process that um, there's a lot of stakeholders that need to be involved in this, state employees, legislators. Um, so we're, we're proposing to work with uh, legislative leaders to bring this down to a level of specificity because um, it is something I think that's fairly complex. We're also not expecting to do this in one year. Um, so we would like to set the train in motion, if you will, um, and then work on the structural budgetary pieces as a follow on piece of work. When I say budgetary pieces, meaning the, the state government budget structure. So why don't I end there and I'll take some questions and then we can transition over to uh, Great. religion and schools. Thank you. Uh, committee. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Secretary French. And I guess the one question I have is, did you look at it from both sides of saying like, I think it makes sense to definitely combine it under one roof and one administrative structure. Did it, did the administration look at uh, the, the doing it the reverse of taking the stuff that education is doing and putting in DCF as well as taking the DCF stuff and putting in it? And, and why did you decide the one way you decided? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think there, um, <clears throat> I will say this is not a new topic. Uh, it's been on the table since I started as secretary at least. I think my predecessor, uh, Rebecca Holcomb and uh, Secretary Gobey, the year, I think probably 2017, somewhere in that time frame, 2016, 2017, um, had conducted a statewide tour, um, a, sort of a listening town hall, if you will, about how to address issues around 166, how was 166 being implemented, how's it going? And certainly, as I mentioned, the public schools um, were definitely, had been almost uniformly critical of the dual agency oversight. Um, but the result of that sort of visitation around the state was that, um, this is just sort of my editorial comment, but the secretary's basically concluded that uh, it was, it's hard to get agreement on this area, so therefore we should divorce. And that's what I, I, I used to call it the divorce bill. You know, So there was a bill introduced in 2018 or 2019, uh, Senator Bruth uh, brought forward to divorce this and to break it apart. And um, that was sort of my initiation into this policy space as secretary, because um, I you know, was certainly focused on Act 46 at that moment. But um, I, I observed that it is problematic to have multiple agencies involved in implementing a single program. So I thought the divorce was a useful construct. I was very interested at that time looking at fixing 166 and then figuring out how to staff it inside of state government second. Um, I've subsequently come around to think um, it's hard to get better policy if we don't have coherence inside of state government. So we've been working on this for a bit, I guess my long-winded response. Um, I think there's been a natural impetus to kind of think about pulling things from AHS and putting them into other agencies just because AHS is so large. This is just my editorial observation as someone who doesn't work inside of AHS. Um, but also the agency of education has started to take on some of the technical sort of back office functions in this area. So we, once again, we own the data warehouse. Um, we've been sort of, we, we run the bulk of special education so there are some programmatic pieces that um, sort of put the momentum on our side as well. And the fact that uh, we're smaller um, and many of the functions that are in pre-K make sense if they're attached to the rest of the education uh, process. Okay, thank you. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you. Um, and we also are looking at this in Senate Health and Welfare, at least we've taken a, a quick look at it. Um, I guess what, the question that I have is, did you consider at all uh, having a universal pre-K and then building special ed uh, and, and moving some of the special ed issues into um, education rather than uh, 
parent-child centers, home visiting, um, and some of the, uh, we've done a lot of work over the past few years in integrating these systems, including CIS. And now it feels like all that work is being pulled apart. Uh, so did you consider looking at universal pre-K and then the special ed integration that I think has always been uh, an issue? Yeah, I think, you know, this, the, the topic, I appreciate the question. Universal pre-K for me sort of falls into that conversation about what is the policy. Um, and my initial uh, disposition towards this was to let's talk about the policy and then, then figure out how to structure uh, the state government response as a secondary approach. As I mentioned, I sort of come around to that uh, as we've had difficulty articulating reform to 166. Um, in particular is that we're working across agency boundaries and there's just a lot of effort and energy focused on just convening that conversation in state government on how to, how to create better policy. So I think, you know, the thinking here is to create a structure that is set up by definition to be integrated um, and to have also organizational capacity and all the resources focused on the policy and then to uh, advance policy as a secondary outcome of that. But right okay. now... Um, inside the Agency of Education, um, we have a team of five people essentially that works on pre-K. We have a director of, of pre-K, uh, but we don't have adequate policy staff to really get into advancing a larger policy on pre-K. Essentially, our staff are solely focused on administering Act 166 as it is. So once again, creating a division inside the agency and a division director that's gonna be focused on early learning and care with a robust staff of approximately 35 people gives this policy area some, some horsepower, so to speak, that allows that will allow us to engage more uh, proactively on policy development. So, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna pivot to talk about special education, but I'll, I'll stop No, there. go ahead, please do. Yeah, I don't, um, I'm not, I don't see this necessarily as taking things apart. Um, I know there's been a lot of good work that's gone on I will say, um, I think the bulk of special ed obviously happens, I think, in the agency of education. I mean, that's, uh, we take over um, pretty clearly after grade three or age three, and then certainly up to age 22. So the bulk of it is inside the agency of education. So it, it makes sense to me sort of uh, naturally that we would put it all under one roof as to having a slice of it someplace else. But I, I understand there's a lot of integration that's already occurred. I, I, my intention would be to, uh, this, this organizational structure would be a catalyst for further integration, not something that would be disruptive of the work that's already occurred. Well, that will remain to be seen. So we'll have to, there are a lot of details there and a lot of questions to be asked, obviously. Um, when I see different uh, programs being moved to the Department of Health or to somewhere else and not fully integrated, it, it is a concern. It's not a concern so much from the administrative side because that what you're suggesting poses administrative efficiencies, but it does suggest that there may be some confusion on the part of families and children and what the, <laughs> what the model looks like uh, for the, kids who are zero to three and maybe even zero to five. So just- Yeah, I think, um, I think there would be a disruption. Obviously this is a significant change. Um, but I'm, I yeah, no, and I don't mean just in the change process. I mean, once it's accomplished, we, we, we see in so much disservice to, um, to people sometimes when we try to make uh, administrative efficiencies. and. As you were talking about Finland, for example, the amount of resources that are put into the work that Finland does on after school or early childcare is significant. So it seems to me that one consideration might be simply to increase the resources available to your agency to cover the, the needs that are currently there. Uh, I'm, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a feeling that we're gonna start spreading ourselves even thinner than we are. That, yeah, I, I'm, that's just my initial response. Yeah, no, I think these are great, great conversation. I, I, you know, I would just make the general observation again that there's, um, 
from a national perspective, there's no right way to do this, you know, so there's no one way that everyone's realized is the best way and all states are administering idea B, idea C, special education and so forth. Yeah. Virtually all states have some commitment to pre-K. Um, so there's, there's no one right model. Um, I think what we're talking about is what's the best potential model for us as a state and I think we do have to be cognizant of the resources we do, do have based on uh, the scale at which we operate, which is you know, from the public education system, 75,000 students. Um, so we, we have to keep that in mind. Um, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a time, it's a conversation that we should have a focused conversation about. I, would, I agree the Finland's also, you know, from a financial point, put the prioritization on making the investments, but they also have straightened out a lot of their infrastructure. It's, a, it's essentially a seamless integration from their perspective on doing that. So it, the two go hand in hand from my perspective. It's not just a question of putting resources. And I, I couldn't honestly guarantee to you if you were to give me additional resources in this regard, I couldn't guarantee you that we'd have the policy outcomes that you desired uh, because there's a lot of uh, internal, um, I would say uh, tension between the apparatus and how we how these services get delivered. And so it's, it's I think it's, it's got a lot of potential if we try to put these together under one roof. Senator Lyons, did you have a follow-up? No, I'm... Okay. Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, uh, Secretary French. When you talk about 75,000 students, that includes what ages? From zero? That's K through 12 students in our public education system. How many... How many children are we servicing from zero to three at the yeah, i don't i don't have a solid handle on those numbers because it's not an area i have direct oversight over um ahs would have that yes absolutely okay thank you any other questions uh thank you mr secretary i, I guess my only question right now uh is it doesn't sound like there's anything for us to do. Uh, it sounds like this was, a, again, a, a, a good overview of what uh, the administration is thinking about. And you'll continue just to be in touch with us as you move forward and if there are certain policy decisions that you'll need us to consider along the way. The one, yeah. is that accurate? Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to come and give an overview. Um, to date, uh, this this presentation has been provided, um, I think, to a joint uh, meeting of the House Human Services Committee and the House Education Committee. Um, we haven't had a chance to sort of, that was last week, I don't think we've had a chance to sort of recoup uh, inside of state government, um, but we'll be reaching out um, and if there's interest in pursuing this with folks. Great, thank you so much. And the other thing, just so you know, uh, knowing how busy your schedule is, I can't imagine you are checking our agenda every day, but uh, Allie Richards is coming in tomorrow and uh, she is going to sort of give Let's Go Kids their sort of overview of what direction they're heading in, what they would like to do. Uh, and I also asked her to just to weigh in on it, weigh in on this. Uh, so. Yeah, we've, we've had a great conversation on it. I mean, they're, um, to their credit, they've put together a very solid plan, um, which, which I appreciate. Um, it is, it's, it's just to make the observation, it's, it's been an interesting policy space um, for me. This is an area where there's broad agreement that pre-K investment should be made in early learning and care um, across the political spectrum, across different advocacy groups. Yeah. On the other hand, it's exceedingly challenging to get consensus on how to do it, you know? Um, so everyone's heart's in the right spot, but the mechanics of it um, are tricky. Thank you. Well, now on to an easier topic. Um, uh, so uh, I'm wondering uh, if you would, as we start to look at this issue, just sort of bring us back, if you're comfortable doing so, uh, where things are, how things got started, and the agency overall, what you're doing to respond. Yeah, um, it's a great way to frame it. Um, and I have uh, about 15 more minutes left, so I'm going to okay. you know, just, uh, just let you know. Um, <clears throat> there's been, uh, and, and I, I'm in, intimidated somewhat by Professor Teachout being here, who I only know through reputation, but um, I will, I'll just make my sort of layman's observations and also a secretary. I'm not an attorney. 
Yeah. But there's been there's been a national um, effort uh, to look at these issues, and in particular, um, the Trinity Lutheran decision of the U.S. Supreme Court a few years ago in Missouri. Um, and there's been more or less a, a sort of a change in how the Supreme Court's looking at these issues. And there, there was sort of a national effort to look at state constitutions and the provisions of state constitutions um, and how, how they might apply to these, these questions of separation of church and state. Vermont is a state that has such provisions and what we call the compelled support clause. So there's been active litigation around the country as part of sort of this national change and in, in disposition towards these issues. Uh, we've been, I wanna say caught up in that. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm a named litigant in two cases right now. Um, one's on dual enrollment. If you're familiar with our dual enrollment program, um, we um, basically provide uh, two courses uh, for free for students. And we we have not allowed students to attend, uh, let's say religious high schools to participate in that. Uh, so there was a case brought forth on that issue. Um, the, the other case has to do with tuitioning. And this is the one I'll speak more directly to. I, I did send to your committee sort of a description of a guidance document. I won't put it on the screen, but you have that sort of for your background reading. The, um, the tuitioning uh, system in Vermont is based on, uh, you know, once again, the state's ultimately responsible for the education of students per our constitution. And that's been sort of agreed on through the Brigham decision. And most recently, I think in, with Act 46 and the litigation around that, um, the state delegates authority to local school districts on how to educate students and districts basically have two modes or means by which they can do that. One is they either operate schools or two, they provide tuition for students to be educated in, in some other school. And those other schools are have to have some approval status through the state. They have to be approved to receive public tuition dollars. Um, so we get into the status argument, you know, how, how are these schools approved or not? Uh, we've had some litigation in Vermont, um, starting with the Manchester decision and then, um, more recently in the Chittenden decision, which I still think is 1999, <laughs> but uh, still fairly recent. And um, around this issue of to what extent uh, religious schools can receive tuition. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this is where I'm going to get uh, sort of hesitant of what I say, but I think basically folks would agree that the Vermont Supreme Court has decided that uh, religious schools can receive public tuition dollars provided there are adequate safeguards to ensure that the funds that are being used for tuition are not also involved in, with religious activities that the, the religious school might be in, directly engaged in. So that's sort of the rub of it. It's not about, in Vermont, it's not about whether uh, religious schools can receive tuition, yes or no, because essentially that's been decided. Yes, they may, uh, but with school districts who make those decisions have to ensure the funds are being used appropriately. And that's where we get into uh, the, the document that we, I shared with you that we recently published um, to provide, uh, we can't basically from a state perspective or the agency's perspective um, decide whether religious schools are, should receive tuition or not. That's been decided by the Vermont Supreme Court. The answer is yes. The question is how do school districts go about ensuring there are safeguards on how those dollars get used so we provide some recommendations on how they might do that. Um, but this is a topic of active um, consideration by the courts literally this week. Uh, so um, it's a dynamic situation to say the least. Thank you. Uh, questions for S uh, Secretary French before we uh, hear from Professor Tichel. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, feel free. I know you might have a few moments. We are actually, before I turn it over to uh, Professor Teachout, I wonder if we might just take a quick two minute break. I just need to uh, check in uh, down the hall and uh, I apologize for that. And we'll just take a, an early stretch if you don't mind, Professor, just for uh, two minutes and then we'll be right okay. back. Thank Take you. your time, okay. I'll see if I can pull up a document. So is that what you were hoping for? I'm trying to, I think I've got it coming, Mr. Chair. Here we, uh, no, that's just the appendix, unfortunately. Uh, so shall we go without, 
how to, which if the problem is now I have to find my own testimony. I'll be right with you. Okay. I apologize. And senators, uh, please know if you haven't found it, it is uh, on our web page under today's date. And then uh, go to Professor Chichuk's name. That's not it. Okay. I can share it from here if you want. Jeannie, if, if, if somebody or if somebody could share it from there, that would be great because I, I am having it difficulty finding it on my own laptop. <laughs> Jeannie, if you don't mind doing that, that would be a big help. There we go. Ken, is that visible now? It is. I'm just going to ask Jeannie to enlarge, uh, enlarge it, enlarge it, please. And Jeannie, when I ask, maybe we'll scroll down a little bit so I can refer to specific points I make. My name is Peter Chicha. Uh, I'm just going to uh, hold on one second, Professor. Uh, Jeannie, can it, is it possible to make it larger? Um, it's full on my screen. I don't know okay. how else to so do So senators it. should just follow along uh, on their, their iPads. Before you start, I just want to uh, pause for just a moment and just recognize that this can be, is uh, a sensitive topic uh, in the United States, um, in this state. Uh, sometimes even with one another. And so uh, what I appreciate, and I know uh, we all do, is just a respectful, thoughtful dialogue uh, around this uh, topic that, you know, again, can be, can be sensitive. So with that, Professor, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, appreciate it and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My, <clears throat> my name is Peter Teachout. I'm a professor of constitutional law and First Amendment law at Vermont Law School. And my areas of interest are United States and Vermont constitutional law and history. I've published a number of articles in those fields, although not in this specific field. And I've testified before other committees and the Senate Education Committee on previous occasions on other issues involving constitutional dimensions of legislation being considered by various committees up there. I hope in my testimony today, which I'm gonna to try to keep as brief as possible, I can be helpful. Uh, I'm gonna sh share with you just a few ideas. Uh, I want to apologize in advance for my written testimony. It was, it's a rush job, but I thought it'd be more helpful to have something in writing than nothing at all in writing to refer to. So. I'm gonna share with you my own suggestions, my views, but I'm very much open to question and criticism and pushback uh, because this is an area that uh, is a potential landmine in terms of constitutional issues. I, my whole effort, I was, by the way, I was born and raised in Vermont, went to the Union School in Montpelier and Montpelier High School uh, and uh, very much bring to uh, I guess the teaching and thinking about constitutional law, what I would call a, a Vermont sensibility. So, so my instinct here, just to give you a little perspective, is to see if, is there some way to bring Vermont's tuition reimbursement policy, which Secretary of French just described, into compliance with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the Espinoza case without violating the compelled support clause in Article 3 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution. I have, in preparation and in other earlier discussions, I've read uh, District Court Judge Rice's decision that was handed down on January 7th in AH versus French. I read the emergency injunction that was issued by Circuit Judge Menashe in that same case just a couple of weeks ago on January 22nd. I am familiar with the best practices memorandum that Secretary French referred to that was issued by the Agency of Education on January 15th. And I have to say I'm impressed by that document and generally agree with the approach recommended there, 
with a couple of concerns about practical implementation with respect to the recommendations. So consistent with that background and just as a sensible stopgap measure, this is my suggestion. I suggest that school districts that are subject to the emergency injunction that was issued by the circuit court adopt and announce the following policy. It's, here's, here it is. It's the policy of this school district to authorize payment of monthly requests for reimbursement of tuition from all independent schools, regardless of religious status or affiliation upon receipt of certification that none of the tuition for which reimbursement is requested has been or will be used to support religious instruction, worship, other religious activity, or the propagation of religious views. Now, Jeannie, could you scroll down just a little bit at this point? Okay, there we go. Okay. I want to stress that if this policy were to be adopted by school districts, it should apply to requests for tuition re reimbursement from all participating independent schools and not just those that are somehow have religious affiliations. It's really important that it be applied neutrally and equally and uniformly across the board. So this is a pretty simple, as I would call it, Vermont solution, but I think it does the work at least as a stopgap measure. So why does it do so? It's in compliance with Judge Rice's decision in the AH versus French case and with Judge Menashe's emergency injunction, since there would no longer be discrimination, quote, based solely on religious status. It would be consistent with the US Supreme Court's ruling in the Espinoza case for the same reason. Chief Justice Roberts throughout the majority opinion in that case says the problem in this case that we are dealing with is discrimination against religious institutions or religious persons based simply or solely on religious status. We do not decide whether or not there can be some restrictions on the religious use of government aid or money. We're just not deciding that. So, this proposal also is consistent with the court's approval in earlier cases of the use by government of what I call the certification mechanism. Notice it's pretty simple. You're entitled to tuition upon certification that none of the tuition that you're requesting has been or will be used for religious purposes. And I'm gonna elaborate on that just in just a moment. Uh, but this is an approach that has been approved by the courts in earlier cases, uh, there's an Agostini case involving special education in uh, religious schools and Mitchell versus Helms, which involved providing educational uh, materials and equipment to both non-religious and religious schools. As those cases demonstrate, it's a simple and practical and workable approach. And then next paragraph, most importantly for school districts in Vermont, it's consistent with the su compelled support clause in article three of chapter one of the Vermont constitution and the Vermont Supreme Court's decision in the Chittenden case. It provides, the court has said, a constitutionally sufficient safeguard to ensure that Vermont taxpayer dollars will not be used to support religious instruction or worship or the propagation of religious views with which taxpayers may fundamentally disagree. So in the appendix to my written testimony, I have laid out the basic history, background, original understanding of Article Three in the Vermont Constitution and in particular, the original understanding of the Compel Support Clause. And I think if you're interested in history, you will find it very interesting. It's also relevant, I think, to what we're dealing with here. What I'd like to oh, we, we lost you there, uh, Professor. Uh, it looks like we've lost him altogether. Uh, let's just uh, give him a minute to make his way back.
There you are. There, I'm sorry. I got, okay. I got cut off momentarily. I don't know where I got cut off, but it's not terribly important. I think you can get a sense of where I'm going. I suggested sort of a very simple approach uh, to, to dealing with this pr problem, at least in the short term. I just wanted to say a word that the court, the United States Supreme Court in earlier cases has approved this certification mechanism as a way of providing safeguards against government funds and government aid being used to support religious instruction and worship. And I quote from that opinion in my written testimony from a concurring opinion written by Justice O'Connor concurred in by Justice Breyer, which was essential to the court's decision to uphold a particular program providing educational materials and instructional equipment to both private secular and private religious schools. And in that quotation, the, Justice O'Connor writes, the safeguards employed by the program are quote, constitutionally sufficient and what they did is both the federal government required that the aid provided not be used for religious worship or purposes or instruction. And the states required signed assurance that the government aid would not be used for religious purposes or instruction. I think they put it the other way around, would only be used for secular uses and purposes, but it was the same thrust. So that mechanism is available. It has been approved in other cases. It kind of does the work and does it in a very simple and straightforward and practical way. I wanna make just one other general point other than providing you with that historical material about Article Three, where it came from, the original understanding of what it meant. And that is to say that one of the key differences between the Montana constitutional provision, which was challenged in the Espinoza case and the compelled support clause in the Vermont constitution is the Montana provision was based on replicated what was called a Blaine amendment. Blaine amendment never adopted at the federal level but lots of states adopted sort of mini Blaine amendments. And uh, the problem with, with, with those provisions, the court said, is they were intended quite specifically to discriminate against Catholics. The Vermont Compelled Support Clause had no such purpose, was adopted at a very different point in time. Its purpose was really to protect what the, back then the Council of Censors called the right of conscience. That is the right that each of us have to be sure that our taxpayer monies will not be used to support the propagation of religious views with which we fundamentally disagree. Now, I think the committee may have seen a very helpful PowerPoint developed by Jim Damaris for the Legislative Council. That gets into the weeds a lot more than I do here, but I just wanted to share with the committee, hey, look, it's really important right at this point in time for the local school districts that are affected to make clear that their policy now is not to discriminate based with respect to tuition reimbursement, with respect to the religious status of the school that's requesting reimbursement, but still at the same time ensure that in doing so, you don't violate the compelled support clause of the Vermont Constitution by providing taxpayer support to, for, for the purpose of religious instruction and worship. So that's the basic thrust of my testimony at this point. There are lots of complications, but that is the basic thrust of what so I would like I, to- If I may, I just want to, uh, before we start questions, I just want to, to back up just so everyone knows where we're at. This, again, um, we're talking about tuitioning districts, is that accurate? Districts that are tuitioning, um, that have the ability to tuition out. I uh, okay, Sandra. Um, Please, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Demery, Vice Council, that is true that this would apply to tuition districts. However, operating districts on a one-off basis 
can approve a student uh, to be tuition out of the operating district to an, another school. So it also uh, could apply there as well. It would apply where, Jim? So if, if, if for tuition districts for sure, a school that operates, for example, a high school, if the parent of the high school student says, hey, uh, the school doesn't offer programs that I want my child to have, okay. it's offered over there at this other school, then the school district can tuition out that one student to the other school. Okay. So can't can't apply to operating districts as well as to tuition districts, but in the main, it's around tuition districts. So related, so that's helpful. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you would start by helping us. How would you define religious purposes? In other words, you know, if you think about how one teaches science, what they teach, what an afternoon uh, after school program might involve teach and support. How, how, how would you define that? Well, that is a problem, and I want to recognize it is a problem. Under my approach, you would leave it up to the school, the school, the independent school, in this case, either a religious school or not a school, to simply say, we're not using this money for, we could change that language from religious purpose, for purposes of religious instruction, or worship, or for the propagation of religious views. So you could get rid of the word purpose, except saying for purposes of. Uh, and, and then under the certification process, it's not great, but, it, but it's, it's very simple. You would leave it to the independent school to certify. We're not using your tuition money for purposes of religious instruction, worship, mm -hmm. or the propagation of religious views. That requires a certain amount of trust that, sure. that schools will be operating in good faith. But all I can say is in Mitchell versus Helms, the court found that that was an, a sufficient safeguard against, against abuse. Now, if abuse comes to the attention of the public or the authorities or the school district, I think maybe we ought to build in somewhere into the system some grounds for saying you were going to lose your status as an approved school. Um, but that's sort of secondary to the basic approach. Let me, if uh, I could just allow. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I do know uh, others have questions, and I just want to sort of get some of those out there. Uh, Senator Chitton, did you have you had your hand up? You do not. Senator Hooker. I, I think this is pretty basic and maybe it doesn't even apply, but are those schools that are receiving funds required to have separate accounts for that money so that it can be assured that the money's not being used for religious purposes? That's a really good question. The answer is right now, no, because they have been automatically denied until now their ability to apply for tuition reimbursement simply because of their religious status. So we're moving into another world. Now, the best practices document that was promulgated by the Agency of Education suggests there might be three sort of categories of schools that would be applying for tuition. There are schools that would say, we, we don't use tuition money for religious instruction or worship at all. Or two, to the extent we have components of religious instruction and worship at our school, those programs are completely separate from the basic secular program. I don't know if that's true for any school, but that at least would be a second category. The problematic category is the third one, where you say, well, okay, and this is your question, Senator Hooker, how do you, as a sort of an accounting matter, separate out those components that involve religious instruction or worship, especially at a school that promotes itself as, how can I put it, uh, being pervasively religious? 
throughout the entire program. That is our entire, and in, in some ways that's the attraction of the school because sort of the entire program involves um, uh, wait a moment, help me out with the right word here. Well, just a whole sort of soup to nuts experience around with regard to religion. There are some that, some schools that might do that and that's their, that is like there's, there's no point, if you will. So, and, and I think that's, a, that, that's uh, the idea is maybe the agency of education could sort of set up an accounting system. Well, you can't include teachers that you would want to cover under a ministerial exception. That is, that's a special tech category, or you might want to exclude from eligibility certain particular uh, courses in the program. But it just seems to me you get into incredible levels of complexity. I would hate to sort of draw up a laundry list of those mm. courses that qualify, those aspects of the program that qualify, or those that don't. That's why it's so much simpler simply to say, hey, look, we aren't maybe requesting the full load of tuition reimbursement, but we do guarantee you that the tuition reimbursement we're requesting has not been and will not be used for purposes of religious instruction or worship. But it's, a, it's an incredible problem once you, if you try to developing an elaborate accounting system for figuring out what qualifies or doesn't qualify. Jim, Jim Damaris and I have talked about that. Uh, so I invite you if you'd rather approach it that way, but I was trying to make it as simple as possible. Sure. Uh, other questions? A uh, Senator Lyons. Uh, I'm, I guess it's, it's more of a comment, but it is also a question that regardless of what we do and regardless of what policy a school might be putting in place and then attesting to, it could, it will, it could still be tested in the courts. So it's, it's getting our feet wet and then hoping for the best. Well, even that's putting it optimistically. <laughs> look, look, I said what's really important because of the court injunction that is hanging over those school districts heads right now, that the school districts make it clear that we're no longer going to deny you tuition re reimbursement solely because of the religious status. We're going to give you a chance to apply. Okay. That is, as I think we can say, just kicking the can down the road. And why I think even that's optimistic is because running through Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in the Espinoza case, he constantly says we don't have to decide today whether a more carefully tailored restriction on the use of government funds might or might not survive constitutional challenge. We don't have to decide that today because the Montana prohibition basically prohibits access to this government aid solely based on the religious status. So, so we can say, hey, let's, let's avoid that. The court doesn't rule, doesn't say anything, however, definitively, what if the prohibition really is simply, we can't provide you with tuition funds if those tuition funds are going to support religious instruction or worship. Now we have to deal in Vermont with the fact the Vermont constitution prohibits the use of government funds for purposes of religious instruction and worship. That's the Chittenden decision by the court back in the late nineties. So it's sort of like we're trying to sail between the Scylla of violating the federal constitution and the charybdis of violating the, the Vermont constitution. And the way to do that, at least as a stopgap measure is to simply say, hey, look, you're eligible. You just certify that you're not gonna use those funds for purposes of religious instruction and worship. And, you, and, and we'll provide those funds on the same terms we do to any independent school. Constitutionally okay, practically simple, but it's gonna be challenged. Senator Shindon. 
So I, I concerned that my question might be entirely germane to this discussion, but it's in the ballpark and it has to do with something we've taken testimony on, which is the notion of uh, these tuitions for university programs and direct versus indirect support. It, it, I don't know if that's falling squarely here, but I think Chair Campion made a, a point that if a religious school is going to uh, offset its curriculum and not offer, say, advanced math, thus benefiting by not having to stand that program up and then use the program that the state offers to allow those students to attend the University of Vermont using state dollars through that tuition thing. Is that not part of this broader discussion about re religiousness? And if it is, I'd love to know what constitutes direct support and what is indirect support that we might need to be aware of or condition on certification process. Well, Senator Chittenden, I, I probably am not familiar enough with exactly what you're talking about. It seems to me it would be germane if in fact the state of Vermont is providing state aid to colleges in Vermont to offer courses that involve not introduction to religion, but religious instruction and involve religious worship that the same problem would happen. Now, under the dual enrollment program, my understanding of the way that program works is that we reimburse colleges, including religious colleges, for providing dual enrollment education to Vermont students. But as I understand, we're not providing that money directly to say Rice or if it, Mount St. Joseph or something like we're not providing that aid directly to the religious high school that the student is attending. We're providing rather the reimbursement to the university. So that, I, if that means indirect rather than direct, then that seems to me to be okay. Uh, Professor Teachout, you and I had this, I wouldn't say disagreement, uh, but conversation briefly a few years ago where uh, when this dual enrollment topic came up in, in the Point being was, if a religious institution decides to, as Senator Chittenden said, say, we are going to fire the history teacher, and all of your history classes are now at CCV, that therefore frees up dollars that indirectly could pay off a sexual abuse law case lawsuit it could these these dollars could now be free to you know support the minister all those kinds of things and I think what you said to me at the time was it, it needs to happen in order for that kind of to be to be figured out if you will so I remember that conversation Senator Campion the explanation is there are two kinds of diversion that we worry about one is where an institution uses government aid to directly support religious instruction, worship, something like that. We worry that those funds will be used and, and that is prohibited by the Vermont constitution. There's another kind of divertibility that I think we were talking about, which is that if we free up, for example, the resources that Rice has to teach courses like history or math or science by funding those courses that will free up resources to teach the religion courses. And all I can say is the court has addressed that second kind of divertibility where the actual money is going to secular subjects, but that frees up the resources of the religious institution to devote them to religious instruction. The, the Supreme Court has pretty much ruled that out as a basis for objection. I don't know if that makes good sense. I don't know if I agree with it, but I can tell you that the Supreme Court has basically said we don't worry about that kind of divertibility from a constitutional standpoint. I believe that was our conversation. January. Yeah, absolutely right. That was that was our conversation. January of when was nineteen eighteen? Testimony and our conversation uh, was more recent than that. It could be. It could be. <laughs> Okay. Uh, professor, so, I'm wondering what are the chances of, you know, five years from now, we are having lawsuits around my child uh, was not taught what might be settled 
science in the United States as it relates to evolution. My child uh, was uh, subjected to anti-LGBTQ posters in schools, uh, to, into schools that, that were funding with public dollars. My child, uh, there is a, uh, you know, a, a club or activity that is um, most people would consider to be religious and my tax dollars are supporting that and I have concerns. I mean, it sounds to me that, that we, are, we, we no longer have a, what I grew up with in a way, uh, having had a grandfather that was a judge and, and talking about this, uh, there was a kind of a dark line there with separation of church and state. It seems like this gray area is, uh, it, it could, could cause additional court cases. Absolutely. I can't remember, I think it might have been Secretary French who said that the Supreme Court has, seems to have been moving the goalpost in mm -hmm. this area, increasingly in the direction of saying anytime you discriminate with respect to the provision of government benefits, yeah. even with respect to the use of those benefits against religious uses or on the basis of religious status, that's going to violate the free exercise clause of the concept. So, so the goalpost is moving. But your, your question, Senator Campion, raised another point that I would like to make with the committee. That is, if you read the best practices mm -hmm. uh, recommendation of the Agency of Education, they don't just focus entirely on, you know, religious purposes or not religious. They also say that to be approved, you need to comply fully with Vermont's anti-discrimination laws, for example. I think it's extremely important. Yeah, good point. I, mean, I think two, th two things are important. One, that we have a uniform state policy. What I've suggested is, hey, look, let's just let those districts that are under the gun make a policy statement. But we need a uniform policy and the uniform policy ought to include generally the requirements for being an approved independent school. And that includes full compliance, for example, with the state's anti-discrimination laws. And at least at this point, unless you want to violate the compelled support clause in the Vermont constitution, a certification requirement that you're not gonna use those funds for, for purposes of religious instruction or worship. So, so yeah. Uh, other questions? Senator Hooker. Thank you, um, Professor Teachout. I want to go back to the concept of, you know, the curriculum, say, at a school that is permeated by the um, beliefs of a certain religion. Would that disqualify a school from getting tuition if their mission statement stated? that their um, instruction and their existence was steeped in a particular religion? Well, I'm going to give you a double answer to that, Senator Hooker. Uh, in the Chittenden School District case, Justice Dooley, writing for the majority, said, hey, look, we've never completely prohibited government aid to religious independent schools. We have approved providing them with books. We have approved providing them with transportation, public trans transportation. So the part of the answer is that school districts could still, without any trouble at all, still be entitled to, to receive that kind of government support if it took those forms. But I think a school that had a pervasively religious mission with religion pervading every aspect of the instructional program simply could not certify that the tuition money was not going to be used mm -hmm. for purposes mm -hmm. of religious instruction and worship. They simply couldn't do the certification. Now, I'm representing the plaintiffs in this case. I challenge that. That violates the free exercise clause, but it doesn't violate the free exercise clause at this point. So we're trying to buy a little bit of time until we can figure, I wanna make one, excuse me, I'm for interrupting myself, but I wanna make one other point. The, if the court were to find that even prohibiting government aid 
for purposes of providing religious instruction and worship violated the free exercise clause, that would trigger something called a strict scrutiny standard of review. Vermont Constitution has in this compelled support clause, a constitutional right that is probably as important as the right of free exercise. In some ways, it's just another way of saying that it's the right of conscience, the right not to be required to support the propagation of religious views with which you fundamentally disagree. If you read that historical appendix in my testimony, you will see that the Council of Censors way back in the early 1800s, very much concerned with the problem of requiring people to support with their tax dollars, the propagation of religious views with which they fundamentally disagreed. That's why we haven't had taxpayer support of public school education since that time. You have a follow up, Senator. Uh, Mr. Demaray. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I want to go back to the conversation about making these religious schools subject to all, all anti-discrimination laws. Um, so my understanding is that these schools are places of public accommodation and therefore they would be subject to the anti-discrimination laws that apply to any place of public accommodation, whether it be a school, a restaurant, um, any place of a public accommodation. However, um, there are constitutional exceptions for religious organizations and employment laws. So there's a ministerial exception which says that for certain positions defined to be under the ministerial exception, which is a very vague concept, uh, if you're employed by the school, you don't have um, the same rights as an employee. Uh, to sue the school for discrimination. So I think I think the conversation around making the school subject to all of laws provide discrimination couldn't be done in that category because there's a constitutional issue you're running up against there um, that protects the schools in that way. So, so Jim, you're absolutely right. For example, a school that whose religious views uh, uh, were opposed to same-sex marriage, can fire a teacher if they find out the teacher, in fact, has got a same-sex marriage because it confl conflict, at least if it's a, a teacher who is responsible in part for teaching some course that involves perpetuation of the faith, whatever you put. They can fire them, not covered by anti-discrimination law. But you tell the independent school you want to be free from... Uh, 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 application of the state's anti-discrimination laws, you're perfectly free to do that. But the consequence is you're no longer going to be an approved school for purposes of our tuition reimbursement program. What, what about that? I, I just wonder whether that would be a different form of discrimination based on status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that would be that would be one approach, at least in the short term, likely to be challenged. But you would simply say you can choose if you wanted. If you don't want to comply with our state's anti-discrimination laws, then you no longer are eligible for applying for tuition reimbursement as one of the state's approved school. I don't know why the approval system, in fact, doesn't build that in. But you might. The reason might be because that would be contrary to the ministerial exception. Well, you know, jurisprudence. So we're trying to do the best. You can figure out how else to do it. I, I have suggested one way to respond, at least in the short term. Uh, there are no guarantees, first of all, that it won't be challenged, and two, that, it, that the court won't eventually strike down that approach. But at least at the present time, it would be perfectly consistent with both Supreme Court jurisprudence and Vermont state constitutional jurisprudence. So has, has the case been appealed? I'm sorry, I'm not knowing this. Has, has the case been appealed? Which, the, the, the French case? The French case. 
Yeah, there was a decision by Judge Rice, Federal District Court Judge Rice on January 7th. Right, no, I understand, but has it, it been? It was an appeal. It was appealed on an emergency basis. Uh -huh. And one circuit court judge yeah. issued an emergency injunction. Right. My understanding was either this week or next week, there might be a panel of circuit judges that would look at the same question. But even then, the injunction simply says you've got to stop discriminating on the basis of religious status. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything that it doesn't say you can't stop limiting the use of funds if those funds are going to be used for religious instruction purposes. Okay. okay. Other questions? So, uh, you know, please, uh, if people didn't realize uh, you are now qualified to get one credit in constitutional law <laughs> forward document to me and I'll sign it. Uh, Professor Teachout, thank you very much. Very helpful as usual. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. I feel that it kind of rushed a little bit and there's a lot that needs to be thought over, but I appreciate the opportunity. And if I can be of any help in the future, just let me know, okay? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, it was terrific and, and again, very helpful. And we're glad and grateful that you're on the other line uh, to help us navigate these kinds of issues. So, and okay. Professor, how are you related to Sarah Teachout? Second cousin once removed. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> We're all related. <laughs> sure. Oh, sure. Okay. Before, I, before I leave, Senator Chittenden and I were getting into a tete a tete over who had more ancient r roots in Vermont. So, hey, Brest Orton, when Champlain came down from Canada to discover the lake that bears his name, yeah. He found a white man and two St. Francis Indians on one of the islands. And that white man's name, this is white privilege, I get that. We were summer people, but that white man's name was Teach Out. <laughs> Long before Tom Chittenden was even a spark in anybody's eye. <laughs> you win. You win. Gotta keep, gotta keep that that new guy modest. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We may have you back in again just to talk about your ancestors of Chittenden. <laughs> I'm That's sorry great. for taking up the committee's time. Thank nope, you. Nope. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Uh, and thank you, Jim. Did you have any other final comments? It it sounds to me that um, that this committee and I'll talk to uh, Senator Sears uh, to see how he wants to to handle this. It may need to take some some kind of action. Yeah. So it seems to me there are. If there's action to be taken, there seems to be two paths in my, my view. One is by you, um, as a general assembly, um, and one could be uh, alternatively by the agency of education, education directing school districts to do what Professor Teachout says, which is to have them respond in this way. Because it's really, um, you don't have to take action because it's really the school district that needs to respond and make it clear that they will pay tuition if they get the certification. Uh, you could direct that uh, or the agency could, could direct that. So it's, I think there's two paths. So we could direct the agency uh, or the agency could just take it up on their own. Yeah. Or we, could, we, we would need to act. You could act directly and say, you could direct the agency, you could direct school districts directly. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, you could do either, or you could just ask the agency to direct school districts. Committee, uh, thoughts? And, and Jim, before we sort of discuss this for just a few minutes, is there a, a way, I mean, basically we're, we're getting at this, we're reaching the same goal. Uh, this committee would, having the agency direct it would allow them and their expertise to, to work on it. Um, and then, I mean, basically through rulemaking, correct? Uh, well, yeah, it depends how far you go, because if you do the certification alone, I think you could just direct the agency to, you could actually direct, direct the school districts. <laughs> You have to go to the agency to start school districts to require the certification. 
Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to do that in combination with saying that the schools have to comply with all discrimination laws, then I think you have to take action to direct the, the in statute uh, for the agency to update its approval regs for independent schools to include that as a requirement. Um, so they have regulations that are already around approved independent schools. I haven't reviewed them for this, but I think they might have to need, they might have to add a condition that the school agrees to be approved that will comply with all anti-discrimination laws. All anti-discrimination laws. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So it depends which way you want to go. On that point, though, on, on if you want to go there, it will it will be challenged for sure. Uh, I think uh, in court. If you want to take the safest approach in terms of something that will be more robust in court, I think you just do the certification and just leave it there. Mm -hmm. If you want to go further and require them to comply with the anti-discrimination laws, that's going to raise a separate constitutional issue that is challengeable. So it's a choice uh, to be made there. And those, if we were to move forward with the anti-discrimination law piece, would that be done by the state board? That would be done, either you could direct the state board or you could do it directly yourselves. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, anybody have uh, thoughts or preferences at this point? I think there might be, well, we may need to take a little more testimony. Senator Perchlick? I guess my first question would be what the agency is thinking of doing. Because if they are going to get to do it, then we don't need to yeah. do it. And if we're happy with the direction, if they say, "Yeah, this is the way we're going to we're going to require this certification of all the schools," then that's kind of a done deal. I I like the idea of requiring the all schools follow the non-discrimination discrimination laws. We can, we'll certainly have the agency uh, back in to get a sense of what they're going to do. Uh, others, uh, looking at both these paths, are people wanting to do um, the certification only or, or both? Uh, Senator Lyons, I'm sorry, I didn't see. So I, my question is a, is a, is a step back. To, um, it's for Jim. Do you, do you think that... Um, not having legislative action and legislative intent or a, a new uh, a new request of AOE legislatively or perhaps through resolution or letter do you think that does that in any way build a stronger case going forward or just having the you know that that's the question i guess for me I'm not sure if I can answer that question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, I, I'm looking at the record before the courts who issued judgment so far. And the factual record they've seen is that um, school districts, districts and the AOE have been saying, we can't give you public tuition because you are a loser school. So despite the use thing, the statements may have been about, about status. And that's what's killed them in court. Um, so is it stronger to come into the agency or from the state? I think as long as there's evidence on record that it's based on use, not status, that's a really good thing. Whether it's more powerful coming from the state or the agency, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine the state's got a bit more power behind it. So maybe that would be a better way of approaching it, but I can't. I can't guarantee that. I'm not sure. Senator Hooker, any thoughts? I, I don't to say no because you know. I know, I know. Well, I did have a thought about when um, Jim, you said that it, if we did more than the certification, it would open us up to more lawsuits more right. vulnerability. Um, can you just explain that, I guess? I mean, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm looking first at Senator Perchlick's um, 
uh, thoughts that he'd like to have the anti-discrimination language in there. And then I was thinking of um, Professor Teachout's thoughts about putting some kind of teeth into this certification with some kind of um, know, consequence if you are found to be non-compliant. Yeah, so let's go through the two, two constitutional claims that could be made, okay? The first constitutional claim is if you just do certification, and certification, of course, is based on use, not SAS. That could be challenged because the Supreme Court left it open as to whether they are going to honor that distinction going forward. So it's not clear to me that if you do this, it will survive a court challenge eventually at the Supreme Court level. Because the court might just say, we don't care if it's use-based or status-based, it's still discrimination and you can't do it. That's not where the court is today. So, so it's a bit of a projection, but that's the type of challenge you might see on the certification. Um, um, but if you do the certification, Thing, it gives you at least a better position to be in to argue argue with uh, in that case because today uh, on the record it's based on stats and, and that's what the courts are finding to be uh, inappropriate. So so if you certification there is a constitutional argument still because the Supreme Court seems a bit unsettled on that point. When you do. We require compliance with all anti discrimination laws, including labor laws, you're opening a separate constitutional inquiry. And that is, there is, uh, by, by the Supreme Court decisions that say that certain members of staff at uh, religious schools uh, who basically teach or minister teach education or, miss, or have a ministerial function, the unemployment laws, the protections don't apply to them. So the example given by Professor Tisha is if you are gay or transgender, uh, they find that out at your school. Uh, if you're in a ministerial position, you can be fired for that. So you don't have the usual, usual protections that you have outside that that um, that religious school. So if you were employed by a private school, a uh, secular school, and you were fired for that, you have a claim. At the religious school, you wouldn't have a claim because there's this exception. And that exception comes from the US Constitution. So once you go there, in terms of putting that anti discrimination piece in, that will open you up to challenge that that requirement to comply with anti-discrimination laws basically is a form of discrimination against that religious school based on stats again. Um, so I think that's why, why you've got a separate claim there that would be in addition to anything you have on the main certification. I hope that's helpful. Senator Perchel. And the, the way I see it, I understand what Jim is saying, but since since this would be a re requirement to become an approved independent school, there might be some religious schools that don't follow the anti-discrimination laws, but it wouldn't be all of them. So it wouldn't be a, you know, a constitutional, in my view, which is very uneducated on the topic, but because we're not saying, because you're a religious school, you aren't becoming an approved school, it's because you didn't follow this requirement of following the state laws. And if I understand like one school could say, well, we can't follow them because of our religious beliefs and therefore it's a religious discrimination. Um, but since it seems from what I heard Professor Teachout say, it's debatable. So I would rather fall on the side of protecting uh, Vermonters from that discrimination and then see where the constitutional chips fall later. Uh, Senator Chindon. I, I agree in, in concept with what you just said, Senator Perchlick, but I, I feel like what Jim is saying to us in, in practicality, in practical senses, if we add the anti-discrimination clause, we're inviting um, 
I'm going to just make a, a, a mock idea of a really bad school with terrible foundational and tons of issues uh, that they could then make the claim that they're not getting the funding because of this one little thing. And it's not the, the other reasons why they can't, can't qualify or be certified. Whereas if we just make it a certification thing in practice and practicality, it's going to work out and achieve our ends. And what I think I heard Professor Teachout say is sometimes things are best addressed when they need to be rather than through advanced perspective. So I, I hear you and I agree we need to be anti-racist and anti-discriminatory, but it seems like in this sense when writing this law, it might make more sense to, to just have a, a certification yet to be uh, um, finalized or clarified. But, but that doesn't... That are you saying, Senator Chittenden, that you believe the same goals would be met? In practice. How so? By having certifications that uh, require certain accessibility, certain degree of parking, certain certifications of the faculty that teach there. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm expecting that uh, I would trust most on our civility in our society to have those certifications adopted by the Department of Education that are going to have any of those extreme schools already not meet that certification threshold without this anti-discriminatory clause. But I'm the new guy, so I could go either way yeah, on this. No, I'm just, I'm just, no, this is helpful. It's a dial, it's a conversation. So Jim, does that, would that, the way Senator Chittenden is proposing, is there a way to protect LGBTQ students? Through it's certain not, we're not talking about students protection here. We're talking about employee protections, okay? I'm sorry? We're talking about employee protections. Okay, not so are we able to protect the LGBTQ employees as uh, Senator Chitton puts forward through certification, or, or does it need to be? I think it's kind of the same thing. I think okay. if you require it directly through a law or through a certification or through rules, the substance of it is if you're requiring the business schools to obey federal and state employment laws, okay? It, then there's an exception that they can't take, take advantage of, which is in the Constitution. So that raises to me the question, are, are you then discriminating on those schools based on their status again? So I think that's the issue. I hear uh, the arguments made by uh, Senator Perslick, and I, I agree it's not a slam dunk case on either side. I'm just saying it's an additional substantive claim that I, I think you can expect to see brought in a case. And may I ask, why, why is it not relevant? I mean, anti-discrimination policies, uh, why are students not, why are we not talking about students? For example, could a transgender student be turned down uh, from a religious institution? Could Rice say we're not going to admit a transgender student? I don't think so, because, uh, because Rice, more high school, and Burton uh, are both places of public accommodation. Um, and therefore, um, I believe uh, they are subject to all of the requirements as a public accommodation, which, which bars discrimination based on all those categories of uh, people that you're serving. So I don't think this is an issue around students. I think it's an issue around employment law of staff. Yeah. Now, I'm not the expert in this area, I'll have to say. I have researched it some, but you might want further testimony about, I mean, we have people in the ACLU and we've got people in the anti-discrimination world who can have to testify about how these laws work sure. more, if you want. No, it's a great conversation, very helpful. I appreciate everybody's questions and comments. Um, any other questions or comments at this point? It sounds like we should, uh, table it for now. Uh, let people think about it. Uh, Senator Terenzini has hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Terenzini. I apologize. That's all right. Thank you, Senator Campion. Um, to go along with Senator Campion's last um, question for Jim, and maybe you answered it already, but you know, I'm thinking like Rice, MSJ, Burn Burton, but then some of these. I don't know how you would define it, but a, a real like area Christian school um, that you are sent, you know, you need a, a letter from your church, for example, as a student to get enrolled there and so on. W would a school like that um, have the ability to say yes or no based on 
sexual orientation or whatever else? I, again, if it's a place of public accommodation, I'm not sure the facts you gave me, I'm not sure how they fit that exactly because you mentioned a letter in a church and, but if it's a place of public accommodation, I believe it has to comply with all of those laws around not discriminating against marginalized groups, people of color, people who are, who are based on gender or all that stuff. So I think the answer to your question is those rules would, would apply, but I would love to have that confirmed by somebody who knows more about this than, than me. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Senator Berkshire, I just saw you unmuted. Did you have a question? I, I was just gonna say that to Senator Terenzini's question is, if the school is accepting public money, then they, I think what Jim would say would apply. But like in my district, I have several Christian schools that are just private Christian schools that don't take public money. So they they can do whatever they want because they're a private school. So right. they they it wouldn't apply to them, I, I would assume. I'm not sure about that. In terms of in terms of <laughs> not admitting a student based upon the fact that that student is gay, I'm not sure they can do that. Uh. But Senator, Senator Persley, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Senator Terenzini. No, I was going to say thank you, Senator Persley. You you cleaned up my question beautifully. That was way smoother than how I just <laughs> said it. So thank you for that, it's Senator can Lyon. I, can I so just uh, uh, going along with the comment that Jim made, um, the Equal Protection Clause under the Constitution might um, have something to say about the discrimination that would be seen in a purely religious environment, the schools that we've been talking about now. And that's a question really, I guess. I'm not sure I can answer that question. That, the, the equal protection clause applies to uh, government, uh, government and to, to private um, businesses that are places of public accommodation. Right. Um, so again, it goes back to that same question I've been talking about. And maybe we can get someone from the Human Rights Commission or somebody in here to talk about how those laws apply. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else? <laughs>